Hello and a very warm welcome to our latest World Halls for Welfare Wednesday webinar on today, Wednesday the 1st of June. If you're joining us from the UK, it's just about to start a four-day bank holiday to welcome and celebrate Her Majesty's 70 years on the throne. And now you're joining us on Facebook Live, so I'm delighted that you're joining us for our latest World Horse Welfare Web Wednesday webinar on bridal fit and why getting it right is so important. And I'm sure we're all really well aware of how important saddle fit is for our horses and what can happen if we continue to ride and train our horses with ill-fitting saddles. But the reality is many of us don't place the same importance on correct bridle fit. But tonight, I hope, we're very much going to change that. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Rachel Murray and Di Fisher, who really are sort of two of the best people to come and talk about bridal fit and why getting it important is so right. And I'll introduce them shortly. Um, if you've joined us before, then you'll know all this. But just in case um, you haven't joined us before or you are new to this or haven't joined us that many times, this is a two-way conversation. So please... Um, we really do rely on your questions. The format for tonight is going to be um, after the introduction, Rachel's going to give us um, a 30 minute presentation. Then Di is going to join us on a, a structured sort of panel discussion. And then we have had a, at least 20 minutes, half an hour, where the floor is very much open to you to ask questions. So please, if you're joining us on Zoom, use the Q&A function for your questions. By all means, chat to each other on the chat function, but please use the, um, the Q&A function for your questions. And if you're on Facebook, then put in the, in, in the comments section and we'll transfer them across to Zoom. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, then please do share the live video. And just remember all our webinars tonight, um, as soon as it's finished, and also all the ones dating back to June 2020 are on World Tours Welfare's YouTube education channel. So please do share that with your friends and colleagues because in addition to tonight's focus on, on bridles, we have a whole array of material there. Now, after tonight, we're going to be taking um, a short break, well, a short break, a break over uh, this summer until the autumn. Uh, when we'll be restarting our World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinars. Um, so if you've got any topics that you would like us to focus in on those when we start again in uh, October, November time, then please do send those ideas into education at worldhorsewelfare.org. So now, before we uh, get on with the main business, I've just got to share my screen, if I can do that. Hang on, there we go. Uh, buh, 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 buh. sharing my screen there we go so th this is where you are bridal fit why getting it right is so important um, and now poll question just to get you into the mood how confident are you at assessing bridal fit and we've given you five options here from very reasonably somewhat not very or not at all um, this is no test at all it's just to get a flavor of who is joining us this evening um, also, um, before I introduce Rachel, I just wanted to say that on the World Horse Welfare website now, we have guidelines of correct bridal fit. Now, this is based on the text, a text written by Rachel, who has been hugely helpful in pulling this all together. And it's around promoting the bridal fit guidance. It's heavily illustrated. It's got a set of recommendations of, on bridal design and fit. It's based on research, partly done by Rachel, uh, and also on common sense. 16 page document with three one page su summaries, as you can see on the slide here. So we'll put a link to that in the chat function. So do share that because it is, we haven't got it printed, it's just downloadable as a PDF. So please do make use of that because um, a, a lot of love and, uh, and sweat and tears went into its production. And I want to say thank you to Rachel um, for, for all your work on that. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Rachel, who um, will be many to, known to many of you, not least at her time uh, at the Animal Health Trust. Um, and obviously a, a huge uh, expert in, in sports injuries, uh, equine surgeon uh, extraordinaire, um, and a hu hugely uh, knowledgeable and experienced in diagnostics, especially, especially MRI. Um, and when I was asking Rachel about quirky facts, she said, well, I haven't got any quirky facts. But then I did ask her, I said, well, she said she's married to a rower, 
she is a rower um, and her daughter is a rower. Rachel herself has rowed up to international level um, and all, all of them have been in the second boat for um, uh, Cambridge University, both father, mother and daughter and, and both father and mother have actually got a blue for rowing. So no, no pressure on the daughter whatsoever. So that is an introduction to Rachel. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen. And Rachel, I'm going to hand the floor to you. Thanks very much, Riley. Oh, sorry, Rachel, before I do that, <laughs> um, I didn't get, we didn't go to poll question. I always forget this. So there you go. As an introduction, to, to, we were very split at the top end. About a third who reckon they're very confident, a third reasonably, uh, and the third somewhat. So we'll hopefully get that up the scale uh, more at the top end by the end. So Rachel, sorry for that, over to you. Brilliant. Well, I will go ahead and share my screen, hopefully. And so, hopefully you can see that now. Perfect, you're good to go. Excellent, great. So, um, so I am talking about bridal fit and um, how we optimize this really for both welfare and performance. As Rody said, we routinely fit saddles, but so often bridles are not considered in the same way. And yet horses use bridles in many situations all around the world. Even though we don't think necessarily about how carefully we fit the bridle, actually there are hugely important structures in the head, some of which are not very well cushioned at all, and they need to move and they need to be able to be comfortable. So if we think of the anatomy of the head, there's some important structures which might be in areas where a bridle might sit. So we have the back of the ear, the wing of the atlas, the, now the atlas is the first neck vertebra and it is wide, it's got two wings at the side and those wings sit behind the ear. So there's often a not a very big gap between the back of the ear and the wing of the atlas here. Some horses have a wider gap, some horses have a narrower gap. So that is the area where our headpiece goes and it's, we need to think carefully about those bits of the anatomy. Now the temporomandibular joint, this is the jaw joint. Um, so that, that moves all the time with the bottom of the jaw and, and the, the part of the head that is at the base of the ear. That is called the temporomandibular joint and that is constantly moving. And that is, if we look at it, close to the area where the brow band attaches. Attaching close to that from the base of the ear down towards the larynx or pharynx where the horse swallows and breathes through is the hyoid apparatus. So the hyoid apparatus is a moving structure, but it consists of bones which come down, one comes into the tongue, one goes into the, um, others woes go towards the larynx and they go up to the base of the ear. So they, that is close to the area around the brow band and the cheek pieces. Then we've got the tongue. And the tongue doesn't, doesn't just sit on its own, it is attached to muscles and the, some of those muscles and the bones form part of the hyoid apparatus. So the hyoid apparatus not only forms part of the head, but it also attaches to muscles that go down towards the, um, the, the scapula um, or the forelimb and the breastbone. So, so we've got muscles that attach actually all the way to the leg that come through the hyoid apparatus. And then we have muscles that flex the head and neck, including the brachis phallicus, which goes all the way from the head to the forelimb. So what happens in the head is affecting a lot of different structures throughout the horse's body. In addition, we've got a lot of nerves and blood vessels in the horse's head, and you can see these yellow um, lines represent nerves with the sight of, the with a, of a bridle over the top. So we've got a lot of things we need to consider when we're thinking about the bridle. There have been concerns raised about nose bands and bits, particularly in competition horses, and this has led to introduction of some measurements of noseband tightness in national federations. And this is based on um, a number of different um, areas of research um, which have suggested things about noseband tightness. However, there was originally, and there has been little discussion about the rest of the bridle because the focus has tended to be on the noseband. 
The other things that we um, have been of concern are about oral lesions. So injuries or damage to the inside of the mouth, which have been attributed or people wonder if these are related to the bridle. In a couple of studies, people have looked at this. In, um, in polo ponies, 15% of polo ponies and, and more than half of racehorses were found to have lesions or damage on the inside of their mouth when they were examined. And in Icelandic ponies, in one study, 62% of horses that were ridden in a snapple bit had got damage to the inside of the cheek or the mouth or the lip. And in a study looking at Danish competition horses, which are in competition doing a whole variety of disciplines, 9% of those horses were spotted with oral lesions. These are all different studies which have got different aspects to them, but they do suggest that having lesions inside a horse's mouth can occur. Is this because of nose bands or bridle fit, or is it actually to do with dental care? Because we know if we've got sharp edges to the teeth, which occur normally in the horse, um, because they're grinding their food. But if we have these sharp enamel edges, we can end up with ulcers like this on the horse's cheeks. And if horses are not getting routine dental care or good dental care, then it is really common to see these ulcers inside, of the, inside the teeth. So is, an, is an inadequate dental care part of the problem? In one study, looking at horses um, actually presented for euthanasia or at an abattoir, 72% of those horses would have benefited from dental treatment. And in another study, looking at 300 horses examined with a little telescope inside the mouth, nearly all of those had got sharp enamel edges. And you can see these sharp enamel edges can easily result in lacerations to the horse's cheeks. And overall, it's been estimated that nearly 95% that of horses more than 15 years of age and 70% of horses less could have undiagnosed dental disease. So I think, if whatever we think about bridles, the importance of dental care is absolutely essential in all horses. What about other oral lesions that might be associated with bridles or bits or anything else? Trauma to the interdental region or the bars of the mouth. So this is the area um, between the teeth. So the incisors at the front and the cheek teeth. There's a, there is a, a gap there, which is where the bit sits. And we do sometimes see damage to these areas. And in, when, in these different studies, looking at polo ponies and racehorses, um, we saw, or we didn't see, but it's been reported that about a third of the horses had got damage to this area. Whereas in Icelandic ponies, in the same study where they looked at those with a snaffle bit, half of the horses ridden with a curb bit had got damage to the uh, bars of the mouth. Now this may be due to direct pressure related to the bit, or it may also be related to attachment of the tongue muscles to the bone in the bars of the mouth, which is where it attached. What about a damage inside the corners of the lips that doesn't relate to, um, to the teeth? I have an example here, just, just that I'm showing that we, we've got damage here on the inside of the cheek, the inside of the lips here. And this was related to a bit that was too wide that became unstable in the horse's mouth. So a wide bit will, will move from side to side. And when it moving from side to side, it can, it can start producing friction and damage. Now, a bit may do that because it's too wide, but it may also be related directly to a poorly fitted bridle because a poorly fitted bridle can be unstable and an unstable bridle will lead to movement of the bit in the mouth and can potentially cause rubbing. So stability of the bridle is very important. In addition from the point of view of the bit is if the bit is too narrow, particularly on a loose ring, you can end up with pinching of the um, size of the cheeks and the lips. So, Bridal stability is really important. And why does this, how does this happen? Well, actually the nose band can be really important in this. So we can see in a horse that doesn't have a nose band, the bridle can slip around very easily and increase the risk of trauma. Um, whereas with a nose band, it's more likely to be stay in the same place. And there's been a lot of discussion about nose bands being too tight and nose bands being a problem. However, the nose band is not on its own. So we need to think of, the, of a noseband, not necessarily as a problem, but a noseband for its positive role in stabilizing the bridle. And also for the fact that, that that noseband is attached to the rest of the bridle, which is important. 
when we think about it, you can see that the nose band, a nose band attaches over the top of the head, whether or not it's attached on one side or both sides, it goes all the way over the top of the head. And that means that this unit, of the headpiece and the nose band, actually is a fixed unit. So when the horse moves its head up and down, there, is, there can be a change in distance through here, partly, um, because we've got movement of where this top of the horse's head is because of flick flexion and extension. However, there's very little movement in here. So we can end up with pressure over the top of the head and around a nose band related to that. And so, but if you have a ring in the side that allows a little bit of give and movement and articulation at this point, that can, that can make it easier for everything to move and decrease the pressures. So what are the pressure points under a bridle? So we did a study, which Di, who's also on this call, um, um, was also involved with, looking at what are the pressure points under a bridle? Where are they? When do they occur? Are, those, are they continuous pressure points or only occur at some point during, during the um, stride? What can they be affected by? And is that relevant? Do they affect the horse? So we tested in elite horses with well-fitted bridles. So we were looking at minimizing any variety and making sure that we were only doing this in well-fitted bridles because we know that poorly fitted bridles cause issues. So we used 19 horses competing internationally and a pressure mat was put under the bridle um, at all the different parts of the bridle. So under the nose band, the head piece, the cheek pieces, underneath the, the back of the jaw. So we tested everything to see where we found pressure points. And what did we find? The pressure points that are particularly high are at the front and the back of the headpiece, over the midline, depending on the headpiece and noseband setup, underneath the brow band attachment. And then for the noseband, either side of the nasal bone, where we've got the sharp edges, and underneath the mandible or the jaw bone, where we've got the sharp edges. So areas where we've got anatomical prominences, so edges of the nasal bone, edges of the jaw, where we are potentially bumping against the wing of the atlas, the first vertebrae in the back of the ear, and underneath here, where we've got some areas of anatomy, like the temporomandibular joint, that move. Um, so, and also the hyoid apparatus. So these are very relevant points. Now, does this happen all the time? Is this a continuous, um, uh, is this continuous, this pressure? So let's have a look at this video. If we look at this video, we can see the horse's front of the head is here, the back of the head is here, and this is a pressure mat that's going over the top of the headpiece. So we've got pressure points here at the back of the ears. So this is the left ear and the right ear. And these are the points under the brow band attachments. So we can see as this is a video that's in sync with the pressure mapping here. So as the horse is going over the jump, we've got no pressures. However, when the horse lands and when the horse is cantering, do you see as the horse is cantering, we have different pressures. So during a canter stride, pressure increases and decreases depending on the stride point. So we've got forces coming up from those horses, the horse's legs are up through into the, the bridle, so ground reaction force. But as the horse goes over the fence, we have no more ground reaction forces and we've got no pressure on the horse's headpiece. So it's not a continuous pressure point. These pressure points, which do occur, the back of the ear, the wing of the atlas, and underneath the cheek pieces, these are not continuous. What about, und what about under the headpiece in, in, in trot? So this, we can see as this horse is trotting along, um, the head, the front of the head is away from us and the back of the horse is behind us. So we've got pressure points at the back of the ear and the wing of the atlas. And then we've got the two bits underneath the brow band. And you can see as this, um, this headpiece is quite a wide headpiece, it's a little bit unstable. And we've got pressure on the front of the back of the headpiece as it rocks during the stride point. So again, this is not a continuous pressure. This is affected by the stride. So the pressure points occur at the base of both the ears at the same point in each stride and areas of the muscle attachments, which flex the head and neck and protract the forelimb. 
Then uh, we've got a pressure point under the temporomandibular joint, hyoid apparatus underneath the brow band attachment. Now this pressure point occurs independent of the rider and independent of what the horse is moving. So related to things like the horse swallowing. Because when the horse swallows, it moves its hyoid apparatus and, and there's movement of the jaw. So this is an independent of the stride point and the rider. And then we've got potential impact against the edges of the wing of the atlas. So this is affected by the type of a headpiece. If we have a wide headpiece, it's more likely to impact against the front of the atlas because there isn't enough room between the back of the ear and the front of the wing of the atlas. If we have buckles on the top of the horse's head, we found a pressure point, focal pressure points underneath. And if you have a rolled bridle that forms quite high pressures if the nose band is on top of the bridging. And then the noseband headpiece interface. So if we have a standard, um, well, maybe we could say old fashioned, but a standard noseband that goes underneath the headpiece, we will often see a focal pressure point right on the top of the head where we've got the, the line of the, um, of the noseband underneath the headpiece. If the noseband strap is the width of the headpiece, this may be more likely to tilt forward and back. So you get pressure points at the front and the back. And this is particularly likely if we have a wide headpiece. When the noseband strap goes through the headpiece, then we have real potential for focal pressure points right where this happens. So the local location of that, um, of, the, of that going through the headpiece and the amount of padding can really affect that. Then this horse had been had spent a long time in a um, in a bridle type like this, and right at the point where the noseband went through the headpiece this horse has got white hairs forming, likely a pressure point, which is where we tend to see white hairs. So the location of, of the buckles is also important to consider. So the buckles right up here at the top of the cheek piece are very close to the area where we've got our temporomandibular joint and our hyoid apparatus, and we get our high pressure points. So that should be avoided. You want your buckles further down. So we see intermittent high pressures that are generated by the horse's movement. In the noseband, we see the maximum pressure in early stance. So when the foot, the, the front leg is coming in to be loaded and is loaded, whereas the headpiece, we get maximum pressure just after mid stance. So when it's going over the top. Where are these locations of high pressure on the, on the nose, under the noseband? They are on either side of the nasal bone, you see here. So either side of the nasal bone. We also see greater and lesser pressures at the upper and lower edge of the nose band on the pressure mat. So if the nose is, bought, nose is more vertical, like in a more like a dressage horse, then you tend to get more pressures at the top, possibly because we're pulling up um, on the nose band with the head in that position. And we're more likely to have pressures on the lower end the nose band if the nose is more horizontal in a jumping um, or a jumping or galloping type of position. It's also affected by the nose band type or features. A stiffer nose band comes out further from the nasal bone, so the pressure tended to be further from the nasal bone. And then the height of the nose band relative to the facial crest is relevant. So if the height, if the nose band is higher, close to the facial crest, so that the lump on the side of the head there. Is the facial crest. If the nose band is close to the facial crest, like we have on the right hand side here, then it's very little chance for there to be the movement between the top of the head and the nose band because it's pushed up against the facial crest. And we actually found higher pressures and decrease in hind limb movement in nose bands that were pushed up against the facial crest. So you want them lower down. It's not surprising because we have things like nerves coming out very close to the facial crest. It's also affected by noseband features. So the width of the front section. So if we've got a wide noseband, there is more likely to be pressure at the top and the bottom against the facial crest. And if we have, if, and the length of the jaw pad is really important because we need to have padding underneath the jaw. If you have a short jaw pad, then you tend to get high pressure points against the mandible. So padding is useful and may reduce pressure, but Depending on its positioning and tight, it can reduce stability of the horse's 
of the bridle on the horse's head. So you have to be quite careful um, and it may alter pressure locations just to somewhere else. Tightness of the noseband um, is important. A very tight noseband means it can't move on the horse's head and cause pressure on the sides and, pre and increased pressure as all those pressure points we found. The noseband type. So a conventional Caverson noseband. If it's a conventional Caverson noseband, it, um, it may have no rings on the side and you tend to have no padding under the jaw or over the top. So you could get asymmetric pressures from the leather and the buckle, increased pressures because it may be narrow um, and no padding, and marked increased pressures if you've got the buckle of that noseband right on the jaw. And this is even more if we've got something like a rope, um, a rope noseband. Again, this is a fixed unit with the headpiece with no rings on the side. There is very little movement of the noseband relative to the head. So if the head moves around, there you come that you, ha you have this potential tightness between the headpiece and the noseband with no give. A crank caverson that has got rings at the side allows more movement of that unit with it articulating because it articulates at the sides. So we tended to find lower pressures at risk locations with increased padding and um, uh, um, potential for buckles to be away from the jaw and therefore more symmetrical pressure also. For a flash, actually this has the potential for the highest pressure in the most locations because you've got pressure points underneath all the attachments. You've also got the top, um, the flash, flash strap pulling the, the caverson part of the noseband down and the top of the noseband being pulled up by the headpiece so that you get even more pressure at these locations. The top of the noseband increases pressure and the headpiece increases pressure when there's a pressure mat on there. Um, so flash strap at the attachment, the buckles and the chin will all have potential pressure points. Um, so flash, a poorly fitted flash or a flash that is not well designed has a potential to increase pressure in, all, in both the headpiece and the noseband. What about a drop noseband? This with the rings at the side allows articulation and tends to therefore have lower pressures. However, if this is positioned too low below the end of the, of the uh, bone on the nose here, then we can actually get constriction of the nostrils. So it's very important that this is positioned in the correct place. A Mexican gra grackle has an opportunity to articulate a, a loads of different areas and actually therefore seems to produce, if well fitted, often the lowest pressures of all the noseband types underneath it. But if this is poorly fitted, there are multiple locations where we can get high pressure points. So one of the things, um, having looked at these pressure points and seeing where we do get high pressures, was an attempt to design a bridle to actually prevent this and decrease some of the problems that we see. So this bridle here has got a central, um, in order to increase stability, has a central wide area, so it's less likely to slip around the horse's head, with narrow sides to fit in between the back of the, the ear and the front of the facial, of the um, wing of the atlas, the bone. So this is narrow to fit in that area. Then this area where it splits into the cheek pieces and the noseband attachments and the the um, throat lash is lower down. So it's away from the area of some of the pressure points and increases stability. Having the noseband attaching on both sides of the head makes it more likely to have a symmetrical pressure and avoid the midline pressure over the top because we don't have a single strap running over the top. Then adding padding at pressure points or above pressure points to lift the bridle off the horse's head where we would expect to have a high pressure point. So where we'd expect to have a high pressure point underneath the, um, over, around the hyodaparase and temporary mandibular joint, there's a pad here above that. So the bridle is off the horse's head at that point. Then also for the noseband, padding in the middle. So it lifts the bridle off the area where we've got um, 
uh, where we've got the nasal bone. So these high pressure points at the sides are aimed to be decreased and large rings at the side to allow articulation. So there's padding in lots of different places. So then does that make any difference? So then what we did is we tested this bridle and looked at both the pressure underneath it and the movement pattern. So, um, so we have pressure and the movement pattern of the horse. So when we look under, at the pressure under the headpiece and the noseband, we see with the standard headpiece, we get the high pressure point. Whereas with the modified headpiece, with the padding and the different shape, we've smoothed out that pressure considerably. And you can see here the standard pressure, standard the headpiece, the pressure under the headpiece of a standard and the modified. And you can see how much less there is. Same thing with the noseband. So um, really high pressures here at the, the edges of the nasal bone on this area here um, under the standard noseband and then the modified noseband this is considerably decreased and does this have effect on the horse what we found is that with the modified bridle with the padding and a different shape and the increased stability the modified bridle compared to the horse's own standard bridle which was a well-fitted bridle there was significantly more fall in protraction, so they reach forward further, significantly more carpal or knee flexion, and significantly more tarsal or hock flexion. So made a significant difference to the way the horse is moving. So why? So what we hypothesized, or we thought might be happening, is we think might be happening, is that in a standard bridle, there's potential for interference with muscle attachments. And those muscle attachments flex the head and neck, and they also protract the forelimb, bring the forelimb forward. They affect the tongue and also the hyoid apparatus, which is attached to the sternum and to the scapula, so the breastbone and the shoulder blade. So all of these can be affected by high pressures over these areas. So it, with the modified bi bridle, we think it's potentially what's happening is it's improving forelimb movement, allowing the horse to lift the withers and lift um, the core, stabilize the core and improve hind limb flexion, secondary to that. So you wouldn't expect just pressure points around the head to make that much difference, but it absolutely did and very repeatedly and we, we showed that. So bridle design is really important, but a perfect bridle design is only good if it fits an individual horse. So it's really important that a bridle is fitted for an individual horse. The whole bridle needs to be assessed, including the bits, and the anatomy of the horse needs to be considered. I mean, if we look at these four horses here, they all have different shapes of their heads. So what about the horse's anatomy? A horse with a large crest, this little stallion had a big crest and he had very little space between the wing of the atlas and the back of the ear. And his bridle used to consistently fall off. It literally just would fall off. But um, sometimes um, that can happen, but it's more likely that the bridle will be pushed forward against the back of the ear, which then causes significant discomfort to the horse because it's being pushed forward by the large crest and the, and the wing of the atlas. So it's not surprising that some of these horses start shaking their heads and resisting contact. Oh, when we look at the combination of a bit and the bridle, a bit that's got a long shank, so a long area down here, you can create more forces on it. So if it's a long shank and a long area between the bit and the attachment to the cheek piece. When this is pulled back, this pulls the cheek piece down and forward. So a long shank and a long area between the side, uh, between the bit and the attachment to the cheek piece will actually pull the bridle against the back of the horse's ears again, potentially causing discomfort and resistances, head shaking, all of those different things. And again, the height and fit of the bits, as I showed earlier, is really important. Not all horses have symmetrical faces, just like we don't. So looking at a horse's head, this horse, if we look at the top of his eye to the base of his ear, definitely different. And his noseband used to slip around to one side all the time. So he needs a bridle fitted, it's individually fitted to account for the fact that he is asymmetrically shaped through his head. 
other anatomical challenges to noseband fitting, an area that is short between the mouth and the facial crest can be a real challenge. So this horse has a lovely long space between his facial crest here and the corner of his mouth. So we've got loads of room for a noseband, no problem. However, this horse has a much longer mouth and shorter area here. So we have very little space. And similarly here, very little space between the noseband and the bit. And the result of that is we get squeezing of this, um, of the skin in this area. And so sometimes you end up with rubs and sores because you're not able to, uh, because you have a bridle design with a wide noseband that just doesn't allow fit. So having features that are narrow at the side or narrow in noseband, all of those things need to be thought about in horses with this conformation. And this is even more exaggerated when a horse has fleshy cheeks, like some cobs, some warm bloods have really thick cheeks. So this is bunched up even more and causes a problem. And it's not just for a double bridle, this is for a snapple bridle for multiple different types. So um, the other thing to consider is the shape between the front and the back. So the top and the bottom of the, of, the, of the head. So the nose at the top, the distance between the nose and the mouth and the difference between the mouth and the bottom of the jaw. So these three horses have different, um, different shapes. So this horse is much more equal between top and the bottom. This horse is longer at the top and shorter at the bottom. And this one is even longer at the top and shorter at the bottom. So the nose relative to the chin. So the length of the, no the nose band going over the top and around compared to where its attachment to the headpiece is can make a really big difference. So if this horse had a very, um, had a, a, an a short nose, um, attach nose band attachment at the front, then we're gonna end up with the part of the, no the, the cheek piece of the nose band coming straight against the back of his eye. So fitting is important there. We've also got um, things that may be anatomical prominences temporarily. So for example, this horse has got um, a lump at the base of its tooth. And then a young horse, you may have um, extra uh, a lump as the teeth are growing in. And that, if you put the noseband right over the top of that, then you're gonna end up with a big pressure point of potential resistance and discomfort for the horse. This is a CT of a horse's head, and you can see this horse has got a thickened area of the of the um, um, of the mandible, the um, jawbone, on this side. So there's going to be a different pressure point, and the noseband as it goes round here. So this is a cut across where my blue line is that shows how it's thicker on this side. So we need to consider that in relation to padding and pressure and and so on when we're thinking about the horse's head. Then we may have individual um, problems that need to be really taken into account or maybe accounting for why a horse has discomfort in its head. So this horse, this is the temporomandibular joint, the, the joint of the jaw, and you can see this horse has got damage to it. So it's got osteoarthritis, it's got arthritis in this joint on one side. So it's gonna have discomfort potentially on one side, which we need to consider and maybe part of why it may resist. This horse obviously has a fracture of the hyoid apparatus. So this is the hyoid apparatus, the bones that, that form part of that, and you sort of fracture on one side. So that's not a good thing. Um, and again, here we have got damage at the attachment of the nuchal ligament. So this is the top of the horse's head, the base of the ear. Um, so this horse may end up with discomfort in relation to the headpiece. So in summary, I think it's really important when we think about bridles, not only to think about the bridle, but remember that routine dental care is really important and tailored dental care in relation to, the, to anything a horse is um, uh, doing or the type of um, uh, dental problems it may have. Noseband tightness and bit type are really important, but they're only a small part of the jigsaw and it's vitally important to consider the whole bridle. So fitting of the entire noseband bridal unit is vital for welfare and performance. And there's real opportunities now to use current knowledge to guide recommendations for bridal fit. And that's where I think World Horse Welfare has been absolutely um, groundbreaking really in going forward and saying, and providing information for everybody to access, to start thinking more about bridal fit. Um, there are some papers that we've published that would be um, potential if you want to look at those further. Um, but uh, probably your best resource at the moment is the new is the World Horse Welfare um, Bridal.
guidance document, which you'll be able to access online. So that's it. Back to Rowley, I think. Rachel, thank you. That was brilliant. God, I could listen to you all the evening. Um, fascinating stuff. Lots of questions coming in. Just remember, if you're on Zoom, you can upvote those questions. So please, if, uh, by all means, put your own question in. But if there's one there you really like, then please just upvote them. And Alana's been working very hard in the chat function. And we also put it on, on the comments area of, of Facebook for the references that Rachel um, made during her presentation, and which are also included on the, the, the guidance document, which we've also put in the chat function. So listen, I'm going to introduce Di. Di Fisher is, is brilliant to have Di, but what, in order to do that, I've got to um, uh, share my screen again. Um, and there we go. Now, uh, we don't have a picture of Di, um, <laughs> but we have Di in person, so it's even better. Um, but, um, you know, someone who obviously, um, Rachel comes from the, that veterinary clinical practical perspective, and Di, as well as a, a riding uh, perspective as well, a very um, qualified and experienced rider, as is Di, but she comes from as a master saddler, um, master saddle fitter and bridle fitter, um, competed to a very high level, has been involved in horses in all sorts of different guises. Uh, she's, she's had a direct association like Rachel with World Horse Welfare and supporting our project in Cambodia, which is absolutely brilliant. I think she's working with Carl Hester at the moment, if, if the, the, the website is, it, it, it tells me it's true, um, and um, is, is coaching to a very high level as well. So someone who is going to bring heaps of experience to, to join Rachel and our discussion. One thing you won't know about Di is that she loves classic cars. Who would know that? And her current car is a TR4, um, which is very impressive. I have to say, cars, I've always been interested in horses, never in cars, but now I've found someone who's interested in both, which is excellent. Um, so Di, a very warm welcome. What I'm going to do is stop, stop, stop sharing. Um, and we've got just got a few sort of structured questions before we go into the um, the open questions. And it's just brilliant to have an audience that literally covers the whole of the UK. And I'm not joking, we've got people from Land's End to West Wales to Shetland. So you can't get much better, better UK coverage because we've got people from Ireland as well, across Europe, in Sweden, France and Poland, and then across the rest of the world in Brazil, South Africa and the United States. And if I missed you out, I do apologise. So Di, um, we've just heard some brilliant information uh, from Rachel about the importance of bridal fit and the kind of things that we need to consider. But in your view, do a does a horse's head change shape over time? And so do you need to regularly check bridal fit? Um, yes, you do need to regularly check um, bridal fit more because the actual bridle is made of leather, leather most of the time and, and it stretches. Um, a horse will change shape as it's growing as a young horse, but generally once they get to a certain age, their head is their head. Um, so we have to keep an eye on how the bridle is wearing really, because straps will stretch and maybe not fit anymore. Brilliant, okay. Um, thank you for that. Then Rachel, we talked about age there, Di talked about age. I mean, at what age should you consider bridal fit to be of importance, specifically if someone with their three-year-old is just getting the, the, um, their horse used to, to ha having the bridle on? Is it important then if you're not riding? I think that bridal fit is important at any stage. Um, if once you are putting pressure on the reins or the horse is moving with the bridle on, it's going to have an impact on these pressure points. And if you're if a horse is first experience with the bridle is negative, that's going to have an impact on it forever. So I think from the moment that you put a bridle on, it should be fitted well. Brilliant. Um, I'm not sure we, we've got a question about this, but if someone wants to find a where, to, if they want a bridle fitter, if they want a saddle fitter, where can they find out where one is? Um, uh, the Society of Master Saddlers now has a, a new bridle fitting course, uh, which you could get your City and Guild qualification. Um, so if they contact or go on the website to the Society of Master Saddlers, they'll get all the information from there. 
Brilliant. So we'll there you go. We uh, we always play a game of trying to get the team to to go and raffle up sort of references. But we'll, we'll put the, uh, the the website address in in the chat function for you. Um, Rachel, then, um, if someone is not having any major issues while riding their horse, is it safe to assume there are no issues with bridle fit? So, in other words, no problem, no need to get it checked. I think that many of the issues that are happening with the bridle are, are not obvious. So you, so you may accept this is its horse, the horse's normal way of, of moving, the horse's normal way of tilting its head or being slightly heavier in one rein or um, flopping its ears. All of those things could be a sign that the horse has some degree of discomfort. So even if it doesn't have an overt problem, you should have your bridle checked, fitted well. I think Di would agree with that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And horses, <laughs> you, we have to remember horses are very good at hiding that they're in discomfort. They, they do that naturally in the wild. They don't want the um, lions and things to realise that they're in discomfort or they're injured in any way. So a horse is very good at hiding any discomfort. Absolutely. And, but Rachel, you also gave some very powerful figures there. I can't, you know, that protraction, 4% better protraction if, with a proper fitting bridle. I mean, that, that, that's a real win-win, isn't it? You know, you actually, you, your performance is going to be better if you just to take the relatively simple step of having a, a properly fitting bridle. That, that, so that, that, that must be equally a powerful reason for doing it. Absolutely. I and mean, you can improve your performance very significantly by having a bridle that fits better and improves Brilliant. the horse's comfort, yeah. Excellent, thank you for that. Di, um, will most, uh, when, when I introduced you, I introduced you as a bridle fitter as well as a saddle fitter. So it, it, will most saddle fitters also be able to fit bridles? And as a rider to that, do bridle fitters also advise on correct fitting? Um, yes. So let's let's start with the saddle fitter. Um, most saddle fitters would have a certain knowledge on how a bridle should fit, and more so now that it's been put about by the Society of Master Saddlers. Um, but the, most saddle fitters aren't all qualified so in bridle fit, but they will have a, not a certain amount of knowledge. Um, and then uh, what was the second part of the question? So it, it, about bitting, would a bridle bitting. fitter be able yeah. to advise on yeah. bitting? When with the course we do at the uh, society, um, we do touch on the bitting, uh, but it's very basic. But we do touch on um, looking at the horse's conformation in the mouth and um, looking at the different bits and how they should fit and how um, different conformations fit different bits in different ways. Um, it's really important to choose the, the right size bit in a horse's mouth and hopefully the correct style. But again, that's education. You know, you, a lot of people don't know about fitting a bit, so they need to um, go and find, find a bridle fitter or a bit fitter or someone that can give them that information. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Rachel, you touched on this in your presentation, but I thought it was worth asking uh, specifically as well. If a horse is getting sores inside their mouth, is this likely to be a dental problem or a bridle fit issue or both? Uh, either or both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think you need to always rule out the teeth yeah. because teeth is, is a very likely reason. However, if you have teeth that are sharp and a nose band that's tight in a position that's pressing on the teeth, then you're going to make all the lacerations worse. So it can be a combination of the two. If you've got, um, if you've got a bit that's very unstable and is or tight pulling in, that can exacerbate issues that you may be having from the teeth. So both need to be addressed, really. Sure, and, it, it, and you talked about the confirmation of the horse's head being so individual, and it's always amazed me. I mean, I've had horses, and you know, their their cheap their teeth go sharp in you know four or five months, whereas others don't go sharp after a year. So you you really you you really can't tell, can you? I mean, in absolutely. Terms of yeah. yeah. Um, Brilliant. Di, um, if someone uses the same bridle and saddle on both of their horses, is it likely that it will be achieving a reasonable fit on both their horses 
or the or are horses head shapes unique? We've sort of covered that off, but you know, people often do within a yard. They'll they'll chuck one bridle on to a saddle and, 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 between horses. Mm. How much of a problem is that? It's not a great practice, to be quite honest, <clears throat> because no no two horses have the same size head, same shape of head, and one one headpiece might fit one horse really well, and then be far too hanging far too low on the other horse. Um, and so they have to crank the bit up, uh, which then takes the cheek piece too high. So it's not a good practice. Each horse would be better with their own bridle. Um, I do understand that this happens in a lot of the big, big yards where they're rushing around and they just throw one bridle onto the other. Um, but I'm sure that they all know, um, especially the elite riders, they, they know that um, two horses may fit a bridle near enough. Um, but it wouldn't be a good practice to do it all the time. Yeah. I wouldn't advocate it. I'd, I'd rather a horse had their own bridle. And uh, Rachel, we, when we talk about saddle fit during the course of the year, you know, a horse's shape changes and therefore it's the, the how well its saddle fit, it, it, it's fitting, it changes. Is there such an issue with, Di talked about obviously the issues with the leather, uh, the equipment itself, but is there, you know, do horses heads change shape after their three? Um, no, not, well, they may change, maybe it's four or five. The thing is that they still affect, their teeth are still growing. So, yeah. so you've got, I um, the incisors are still coming in two and a half, three and a half, four and a half. Um, and so you can have some change in relation to the teeth and the cheek teeth are always growing. Um, you may have stallions will change slightly as they're growing up. So you can have some changes like that, but um, mostly they're gonna be fairly stable as Di says. The thing is that, may affect uh, may affect it are uh, what we do so so if they if someone goes to a competition and they put um ears underneath so they put you know ear covers on and put the bridle on then that's going to change the shape of the horse's head and change the length of the cheek pieces that it needs to be so all of a sudden the horse hasn't anatomically changed, but we yeah. haven't changed its anatomy, yeah. at which point there'll be the bit maybe pulled up in the mouth. We may have pressure points underneath um, where we've got edges to that, the, the ears. So all of those things could, could affect it, even though the horse's anatomy isn't different, but we've changed the pressure point of the bridle because we changed the shape of the horse's head yeah. effectively. Good point. And Di, um, I know, I think we've got questions about the cost. So um, you, you talked about how the, the, the leather stretches. What can be people do? Because obviously it's not cheap to get a, a, a decent bridle fitted. But obviously, as we just talked about, it potentially is going to last you a long time. How can they maximise the length of time uh, that, that the leather will not stretch and maintain its shape? Um. Well, most of the manufacturers nowadays are aware of how much leather stretches anyway. Um, and when we're talking about nose bands, crank nose bands, for instance, um, they will put the straps on the back and not make them too long to begin with because they know that they are going to stretch. So quite often you'll find um, when you first put a nose band on, it might feel oh, it's, it's a bit short or a bit tight, but it's, it's not, it's going to stretch within two weeks of being ridden in, that will stretch a little bit. It's usually about half an inch um, to three quarters of an inch over its lifetime that it may stretch. Cheek pieces, only if they're pulled up tight will stretch, otherwise they're usually okay. The head pieces can stretch and yep. the nose bands can stretch a little bit, the straps on the nose bands. Um, the best way of um, dealing with that is not to oil them, but to use balm. The balm seems to keep them um, from stretching too much, whereas the oil, when it soaks into them, makes it makes the leather more floppy and allows it to stretch more. So I would advocate caring for them with balm rather rather than um, oil. Put it. Oh well, thank you. Well, there you go. That, that's. A, I have to say, I did not know that. So, balm rather than all. That's really yeah. helpful. Thank you, Di. Listen. Now we're going to open up to, to you guys, and um, there are lots of questions coming in. But please do, if you've got a question, uh, put it on the comment section of Facebook or on the Q and A tab 
for um, Zoom. And if you're on Zoom, please remember you can upvote those questions. Um, so um, Lindsay's asked, Rachel, and I think a few others might have asked as well, what about pressures applied in bitless bridles? Um, the pressure underneath the nose part of a bitless bridle is actually huge um, when tested with the pressure map. So it's uh, m much higher pressure than you would have under a normal noseband. And it's, it's, a, it's sort of an off the scale pressure. <laughs> it's really high pressure. Um, so, so, so it's a, your, yeah, go on, sorry, go on. So, um, so the, so when you are applying, when you are pl applying pressure on the reins onto a bitless bridle, then the area that you are applying the pressure to is generally over the top of the nose. Yeah. The pressure underneath the bit, underneath that part between the, the part, front of the bitless bridle and the nose that pressure on a pressure mat is massive. Yeah. So, and Di then, in terms of bridle fit, then if that's the case, then, you know, obviously it doesn't have a bit, um, but often people think that um, a bit of this bridle is better because it doesn't have a bit. But what Rachel's saying is actually it's applying significant pressure, which makes fit even more important. What, what's your experience of fitting bitless bridles and, uh, and how um, proficient would be most bridle fitters be around bitless bridles? Um, we, all, we all have um, trained on bit, uh, certain bit, bitless bridles. Obviously you have to because it is a bridle. Yeah, um, yeah. But what, what I would advocate, and we have talked about this within our um, bridle fitting group, um, pad the nose band out more over the, over the um, bony parts of the nose, which will help to reduce the pressures a little bit. Um, the pressures were, as Rachel mentioned, off the scale. We were quite surprised at that. But the only, the only way you can relieve that is to pad the um, nose nose band out at the front and the back and also it depends what bit of this bridle you're using as to um, where the pressures are because of the way the bridle is used there are so many different styles of bitless bridle that pull down on different areas of that nose um, so you have to be aware of when you're using it um, maybe Maybe if you don't understand the bit, bitless bridle, you need to get a, a bridle fitter out to tell you where the pressures are on that, that particular bitless bridle. But I would always advocate um, padding the nose front and back to over Brilliant. the bony parts. Brilliant. OK, thank you for that. Um, Lucy's asked, can riding in a rope head collar or other head collar cause similar problems repressure points. Um, Rachel, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, anything that's, so a rope is a small structure, it's a cylindrical structure that is actually pu pu putting a much more focal pressure on than a flat piece of leather. So, so if you are putting pressure on a horse's head, if you're riding it, um, then um, well, whether or not you're riding it, if you're leading it, um, you've got it and it's pulling away from you or you've got it on a lunge or you've got it in a, any other, anything else that's attached onto its head. If you've got a narrow rope, actually the pressure is much more focal. And if you've got a, um, if you've got a, a head collar or a unit that is held over the top of the head and around the nose in some format, you're still gonna have the same type of issues. But it depends how you are applying your pressure to that. Is it just standing in a loose um, head collar out in the uh, um, halter out in the field, or is it being ridden and guided and moved or led or lunged or or pulling a cart and being um, driven that way? So the uh, what it's doing will impact the pressures. If you're galloping, you're going to have more pressure under your bridle or your head collar or anything else than you are if you're walking, just because of your grand reaction forces. So, so it depends what the horse is doing. Yeah, brilliant. So, and, and both those questions, it, you know, what might 
on the you know, sort of initially welfare, you know, better, you know, but, but is not yeah. necessarily the case. So it's it's about thinking it all through and making sure what's yeah. it's what's right for your horse. Um, I think I'm going to ask Di this, but if both of you are conflicted by nature of the question. But I love the question. It's from Facebook. If you thought your horse had a problem with its head or bridle, would you start with a dentist, a vet, or a bridle fitter? Di, what would you say? I think um, for I think get the teeth looked at first. I would always probably get the vet first because you've got to find out, is there a problem in the horse's mouth first? If the horse is resisting or shaking its head or doing something awful in the bridle, then we need to know why. Um, and if there are any, any problems inside the mouth or any rubs on the head or any soreness around the head before we start to fit a nicely fitted bridle to it. So, um, again, if, if somebody rings up and says, oh, I'd like a new bridle because my horse isn't going very well, you've got to ask all the questions first. Why isn't your horse going very well? What is your horse actually doing? Now, if that horse is doing something awful, um, then I would suggest the vet has a look first, make sure there's nothing untoward going on, and then fit a nice fitted bridle. And... Um... Sorry, yeah, go on, Rachel. I was going to say, I, I totally agree with that. I think that it's very, that a, a what is perceived as a bridle or bit problem is very often a sign that a horse has discomfort elsewhere on its body. So it isn't always just the head. So that's where involving a vet, a vet who will be able to examine its teeth and also the rest of its body. I see many horses who shake their head, rear up, um, um, open their mouth, stick out the tongue, uh, have real um, issues with performance or contact, that actually when we block out a lameness or reduce a pain in their back, that disappears. Yeah. So, and so it is working out if your horse is healthy or if it has a reason that it might be painful, it's gotta be your first thing. Yeah. And if that is eliminated, then definitely, then, then I would evolve a bridle fitter, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you've talked uh, quite a few times about uh, the importance of dental care. Um, I assume, Rachel, a leading question, but you would, you know, obviously a vet can, can, can do that, but also qualified equine dental technicians as well are, are good to use, aren't they? Correct, absolutely. Brilliant. Um, so a question for you, Rachel. I think uh, from Rachel, um, my horse has had both her hyoid bones removed. You mentioned hyoid bones. Uh, can this affect the bridle fit and her performance? Um, when um, normally what happens is there is there's a small, if a horse has problems with its hyoid apparatus, then there is a small, there are a couple of bones that are removed, which are down towards the tongue area generally. And then that means that you stop the, the, um, the, the pressure on the hyoid apparatus from the point of view of movement because it stops being a fixed unit that has to move. So it, it then means the tongue can move independently and so on. So, so it's not the whole hyoid apparatus that is generally removed. It's that you take a piece out of it to take the pressure off other areas. So can it affect the bridle fit and the performance? You have changed the whole movement of the larynx, tongue and so on and how they fit together. So that is different but usually it is done because there has been another problem and it is to manage the problem that's there and it should therefore improve the horse's ability to do a normal job and wear a normal bridle and so on. But it usually is, it's only done because there was an original problem. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Um, where's that question has gone it's disappeared um hannah's asked is there similar research well we talked about the fitness bridles but hannah's asked specifically about research rachel i mean is there is there much research going on around different types of fitness bridles hackam all side pull cross under uh, etc well there there has been some work in the past particularly with the cross under bridle and and so on that have looked at things um and looked at how horses move and what effects it might have um, as far as the pressures, we have done, we have not published it, but but um, but looked at pressures under a few different bits of bridles. But I don't know that there's any other 
current pressure mapping unless di knows of anything that i don't know about no the bitless bridle actually needs more um research i think yeah yeah i, I can't find any um so morgan's asked a question here di um i hello i'm interested in your opinion on bridles with setback headstalls um such as the DIY on on difference bridle. I believe this headstall sits on C two C three. What what's your thoughts on um, that? <laughs> I like the fact that it's not nowhere near the base of the ear or the atlas. Really, um, I've not honestly had a lot to do with them myself. Um, I I know a couple of show jumpers that use them and say they're great, um, but not done any research on that particular type of headstall so um i can't really answer it other than to say i don't have a problem with it and i do know a couple of people that think they're great and their horses go well in them so until and, and until we did some research on it i couldn't really comment on that brilliant uh, rachel any further thoughts on that no i think um if you've got a horse that has got a very small space between the back of its ear and the wing of the atlas, you have a challenge um, to put something there to keep it comfortable and turn its head and so on. So, so I think there's a real potential benefit to one that does that, but it does change the directions of pressure and angles to different things. Um, so um, as Di said, we haven't tested it, from a pressure point so we don't know what happens but if you've got a horse that has a problem or has pain at the insertion of the nuchal ligament anything like that you could see a real benefit to moving everything back there yeah brilliant and i think it's kurt who has asked rachel um uh, about new research currently ongoing you obviously re um, raised a couple of papers that you've been involved in um and references to that are in the World Horse Welfare guidance, um, bridal fit guidance. But are there any existing research projects going on that might come out in the, around bridles or bits in the near future? We hope so. <laughs> so that's a, a provisional yes, I think they call that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great stuff. Thank you. Uh, watch this space. We'll certainly um, so um, let you know when that happens. Um, Hannah's now asked, is there research regarding measuring the pressure points of the bit in the mouth and or difference in pressure among different types of bits? Um, who's, uh, Di, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, I think um, Hilary Clayton um, did some, um, some research on bitting where they uh, had a horse on a treadmill do you know about this, Rachel? Yeah, she yeah. does fluoroscopy, so you like, right. yeah. um, like live X-ray to look yeah. at what happened of the interaction between the tongue and swallowing and the bit for different types of bits, and when they put a contact on the bit. Yeah. Um, so they didn't do pressure mapping, and that's quite hard because mm -hmm. to keep a pressure mat in a horse's mouth and without changing the anatomy and without it chewing it and yeah. swallowing it and getting irritated. Um, <laughs> Is unless you actually had sort of pressure on the on the bit itself, um, it'd be quite hard to do. Um, but but that so but yeah, Hillary Clayton did some really interesting stuff yeah. looking at what happened to the bit and what how the horse moved it around and what affected it. Yeah, I think I think um, you could Google Hillary Clayton's research and perhaps you'll find something on it. Um, but I found it very interesting actually and. Um, it showed the way the bit actually moved in the horse's mouth when there was contact um, and how um, a nutcracker type bit could touch the top of the, um, the upper palate and how a bit with a lozenge um, sat in the mouth when the horse was walking. Uh, it was really interesting. So you might be able to find it somewhere if you Google it. It'll be quite um, a nice day. I, the team, we have to set the challenge to Janet yeah, so she yeah. can go and find a link. We'll, we'll yeah. see if we can do that. And yeah. if we can provide a link, we certainly will. Very, very interesting. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
a lot of questions still about Bitless Bridal. So I, I know we've covered it, but just to, to these specific questions, one from Facebook, Rachel, to you first. Do the principles of correct bridal fit apply in the same way to Bitless Bridals? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. We haven't got to the short answer questions yet, but there you go. Um, and Joanna's asked, Di, looking at bitless bridles for my youngsters, what advice could you give? Um, just basically to go through the same process as you would with a normal bridle. Make sure that the base of the ears are clear and there's a cut back headpiece. Make sure the atlas has got a small cut back if you can. Um, just look at your horse's confirmation and make sure whichever bridle you decide to go with fits well with the confirmation because there are a lot of bitless bridles out there, different styles. Um, so you would need to probably um, go to somebody who, who fits bitless bridles and try a few different ones. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, Vivian's asked, and Rachel, you talked about nosebands, no nose, no nosebands in your presentation. Is it better for a horse to have a correctly fitted, appropriate noseband rather than no noseband at all? It will stabilise the bridle better, yeah. for sure. So, in your view, generally, it would be better to have a noseband. Yes. And is there any situations? that you've experienced where actually not having a noseband has been the answer? A horse that may have an injury or particular area where you can't apply pressure for some reason, even if it's for a temporary period of time. Um, yeah. um, Di, do you have any? Um, no, I mean, to me, we... Most horses learn to open their mouth without a noseband eventually. They may start quite quiet, but eventually when you do a lot more with them, they learn to open their mouth. If a horse is opening its mouth, um, the bridle is going to be moving on the top of its head and the bit is going to be moving in the mouth. So for me, I would rather have a noseband, not tight, but a noseband around the face to encourage the horse to stay still in its jaw uh, rather than fight and fight against the bit. Um, they don't use nosebands in the Western world. They tend to just um, use shanked bits. And people say, you know, um, oh, but the Western horses don't have their mouths open. If you watch the Western horses while they're in a straight line, they're really quiet. But as soon as you take up a contact, usually the mouth comes quite wide open. So for me, as a rider, um, personally, I would prefer a horse with a noseband because everything feels a lot more stable. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, a question on Facebook from Linda. And she said, what are your thoughts on headpieces that are padded but have a gullet in the center at the pole, a pole gap? Do they relieve pressure? or create different areas of pressure? Um, I think it, it depends on the horse's conformation. And it depends how wide and what the shape of the headpiece is. Because I see some headpieces that are very padded, but they're really wide. And so whether or not they've got a cap at the top, because the thing is that if you haven't got, a, a lot of these don't have a pressure point right in the middle anyway. If you haven't got a strap underneath the headpiece, you don't generally have a pressure point in the middle at the top. So yes, it doesn't mean there is a pressure point there, but if you take that gut and put a gullet in there, but often you wouldn't have a high pressure there anyway. And if you end up with padding at the side that makes it fit sides to the headpiece, actually you end up with a really big pressure point on the back of the ear and the wing of the atlas. So um, putting more padding there, which is what something I commonly see as horses, um, and they're often they're, their ears are twitching and their ears are moving and flattening out to the side particularly when they're turned one way or the other so that the gap between the ear and the wing of the atlas becomes less as they turn their head one side is the horse then drops its ear and is uncomfortable tilts the head and people have put more padding in there because they think oh it'll make it feel better but actually it makes less and less space wider and wider and the horse becomes more and more uncomfortable so Putting padding at the sides is not necessarily the answer. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, brilliant. Um, 
Curtis asks, is there any way to make the Fairfax bridle in future in a way that the brow band location is adjustable? It is a really great bridle, bridle, but I see this as the main disadvantage that the brow band height is fixed and thus unfortunately will not fit all horses as the brow band may end up, for example, too high. Di, what's your thought on that? Um, there's always a way of making things um, uh, better, uh, and more adjustable. Um, it's just whether the company want to do that. Um, I've not found a problem fitting any horses with that particular headpiece and brow band. You've just got to make sure that the, it is the correct headpiece for that particular confirmation and the correct size of headpiece for that particular confirmation. They do do um, two different headpieces. One is quite straight and one has the um, shape for stabilizing the um, headpiece in the middle. Some horses don't um, fit that shape, so the straighter one is better, the one that they call a stallion headpiece, I think. Um, but no, I've not had any problems with fitting any horse. So, so, lo so long as it's fitted correctly, it should be absolutely fine. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Rachel, Sam's asked, I mean, obviously, we, we've, no, she's, we, I wondered if there are any useful findings linked to bitless bridles. And we've, we've already covered off that there's not enough research around bitless bridles. So um, unless, do you have anything to add to that, Rachel? Uh, sorry, was, what was the addition? Any useful findings linked to bitless bridles? No, more no more than we've already said. Yeah, no. Fine. Uh, Lucy's asked then, Rachel, what, and I th again, I think you've covered this off four to five, I think you said, at what age is the horse's head considered fully grown, i.e. not going to change? Yeah, around four to five. Yeah. But a stallion may mature more because it depends on their testosterone level. And it, and it, it also depends, you know, if you've got a, a um, if you've got some breeds and smaller horses will mature quicker, some yeah. other breeds and bigger horses mature slightly later yeah. and that it affects every bit of their body <laughs> yeah brilliant um catherine has asked if my horse's tongue comes out at times to the side does this mean there is an issue with the bridle teeth have been checked <coughs> no flash lovely soft leather elevated bridle currently in a miler comfort uh, sorry, lost the top of that question. It's disappeared. Um, currently, the Myla Comfort Snaffle. Um, um, Di, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I see many horses that um, have their tongue out to the side. That can happen for various reasons. There may be something else going on in the body. It may not be to do with the mouth. Um, but one one way of um, correcting that with some horses it does work is a bit with a port which directs the tongue uh, to the center um, either a port or um, a bit that just gives the tongue a bit more room but allows the tongue to be put into the center um, it's hard, to, I don't know how to describe this, but where, where the bit goes up like a port, but it's more to relieve room for the tongue. Not, not We wouldn't call it a port, we call it a tongue relief um, yeah. bit. Um, sometimes that just focuses the tongue to the center and, and stops the tongue going out to the side. But usually if the tongue's going out to the side, I, I'm sure you'll... Um, we might bring Rachel into this because she, she'll know from a veterinary point of view, but there can be other things going on in the horse's body. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. I, some horses, it is just a habit. Whether it is something that was a discomfort issue early on and that they've learned to do that um, and that's why they do it. But for other horses who have developed, started to develop putting their tongue to one side, it can be a sign of discomfort elsewhere in the body. Um, sometimes it's tension because they'll bring the tongue back. And when they bring the tongue back, it then gets um, moved around into, an, into a position to the side or over the top of the bit. Um, and it may come back because of what they're doing with their larynx and pharynx um, or do with the hyoid apparatus and discomfort um, in other parts of the body. Brilliant. Um 
Rachel, I'll stick with you. Hannah's asked a really interesting question here. If equal amount of pressure is applied on reins for bitted and bitless bridles, and for the bitless bridles you measured massive amounts of pressure on the nose, wouldn't the same amount of pressure be on the bit instead of the nose band on the bitted bridle? Well, the thing is that when you apply pressure to the bit in the mouth, that is then dissipated to some degree through the headpiece and then you've got a noseband that's separate. If you thought, um, and the amount of pressure you apply through the rein should, should only be the amount of pressure to achieve what you're asking the horse to do. So a horse that is well-trained should be able to, if you apply a contact, say on your right rein, to say turn right, a well-trained horse should turn right with minimal pressure. A horse that is, um, a horse that is uh, bad, poorly trained or a horse that doesn't understand, you may have to apply a much greater amount of pressure to the rein to get a response. So the amount of pressure you're applying to the rein is very much affected by the training and response of that horse. Um, the, the pressures that we see on the noseband and the headpiece are also affected by the, um, the, 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 the load applied on the horse's legs as well. So, so, we, so if a horse is galloping, the pressures underneath parts of the head or parts of the bridle is greater than if it's at wall. Yeah. So, so it, it's slightly more complicated if you've got a bitless bridle because you've got effects of both of those things probably. Yeah. Diane, have you got that? quite the same. Yeah. Um, no, I think Rachel's covered it. Uh, the only thing is with the bitless bridle, the, the pressure on the noseband is on the, the bony area, uh, whereas the bit in the mouth is on the soft tongue and the tongue can move um, and the jaw can move, whereas the bony area on the nose is, is still. Yeah. So whether that makes a difference or not, I don't know. But yeah. um, I would say so. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Listen, we're coming towards the end. And thank you so very much for your questions. Agatha asked, where is the guide available to download? Hopefully we've answered that, but we will certainly put a link back in, um, put it in the chat function again, as we will all of the references that Rachel talked about earlier. So we'll put those back in, in, in the chat function for you. Um, we've got a question here about costs. And I think, um, Di, this is one for you. For those who do not have over 200 pounds to spend on a bridle what are the best makes or what can be the average what can the average horse owner do to make their horse's life more comfortable without spending the earth yeah um there's there are many manufacturers out there now that have changed the way they make their bridles they've got um anatomical head pieces on them now most of the cheaper bridles that now have anatomical head pieces so it's a it's a case of look looking at all the different types of bridles within your budget and trying to find a bridle that is going to suit your, um, your the headpiece is going to suit your horse's anatomy and and the noseband the headpiece and the noseband shape are very very important you can um, add a little bit of padding under your noseband at home you'd have to check um, if you're if you're competing you'd have to check your particular discipline as to what the rules are for that um, but there are there are lots of things you can do yourself just by putting a little bit of foam under the noseband um, uh, at the front and the back will will decrease the pressure a little bit and help your horse um, or just google all your nose uh, your bridles with the ones that are within your budget and pick a nice shaped headpiece that isn't going to come forward onto your horse's base of the ears. Um, and that's about looking at your horse's confirmation. Yeah. Um, and you most places you can go, you know, you can, um, if you go for a saddle fit anywhere and they've got a shop, ask, could we just, could you just sit a, a headpiece on your horse's head to, to see? We allow people to do that at our shop all the time because no one bridle fits every horse. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. 
Um, so I think we'll need to wrap up, but Rachel, a question from Leila uh, on Facebook. What are your thoughts on Mickham's style of bridal? Well, um, it was designed with an idea to reduce pressures. And um, so that the concept behind the design is is good. Um, but I don't think no how I don't know that there has been that they did pressure mapping when they did it. So the, the the idea was was a good one. Some horses do go better in that than they do in a standard bridle, but there there are some areas of pressure points underneath it that can cause an issue with some horses and um, Di may be able to comment. Um, yeah, I mean, the Micklin bridle works slightly different, doesn't it? It's the nose band is slightly attached to the contact, really, isn't it? So you've got when you take a contact on the bit, you're actually taking a contact on the nose band as well. Um, the head region, they do have a little bit of a shape and a cutout, but not a lot of padding up the top. Of the head which I'd prefer to see a bit more padding um, so yeah I mean I haven't I did look for some research on that and couldn't find any but they do say it was based on um, reducing pressure um, so and I just can't find any research on it so um, I don't know really yeah, um, yeah. brilliant Listen, um, we've almost at the end, um, as ever, you know, the two of you have covered so much really wonderful practical guidance. So thank you for that. Um, Di, having heard all of that we, 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 we've spoken about, what, what would you be your sort of final thoughts, your key take home messages? Um, basically to look at your horse's confirmation a little bit more. Um, be aware of your horse's confirmation on the head, whether whether your horse has got enough room for a noseband or needs a narrower noseband, all that sort of thing can make your horse a lot more comfortable. Um, look at your headpiece that you use and just look at the bridle you're using and see if you can do anything just to help your horse anymore, you know, to give it a bit more comfort. Excellent. It's good to look into these things and learn from them and, and, um, then you'll start to understand how a bridle works with the confirmation of your horse. Yeah, that has come through clearly, especially with Rachel's pr presentation, breaking yeah. it down part by part. Um, Rachel, what, what, what are your final thoughts? I think remembering the whole, the remembering the whole picture that the bridle will not, is not just something that is there to go on the head without forgetting all the anatomy underneath it. Remember the anatomy underneath it and remember that if you get it right, your horse will perform better as well as feeling better because you're impacting the whole horse's body. Yeah, that's a, I think that's such a powerful thing. I mean, it's obviously imperative. We do right what's right for the horse and for the welfare of the horse, but actually here you're actually not only going to feel better, but they're going to sort of work better and perform better, which I think is a, such an important part. Of it too so listen thank you both thank you to everyone i didn't quite get through all the questions but we got through a fair few um so so thank you for, for, for putting those in uh diane rachel thank you so much you've been absolutely brilliant and that that couldn't we couldn't be signing off better uh for the for the summer i apologize if you're in the, in the southern hemisphere then you're going into the winter but for your winter our summer um, you, we, we'll be signing off until November. If you're in the UK, I hope you have a lovely um, Jubilee uh, bank holiday weekend. Um, remember, for those when we start again in November, uh, please do um, email education at worldhorsewelfare.org with your ideas. In the meantime, thank you so much and look forward to seeing you again when we start up again later in the year. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye.